If you have your Bibles today, you can grab those and open them up to Matthew chapter 6. And uh, we are continuing on in our series, The Sermon on the Mount, where we are walking through this extended teaching from Jesus. Uh, it covers three chapters of the Bible, Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. We are walking through chapter 6 right now. And uh, we are just taking our time looking at the teachings of Jesus and how do we uh, be followers of Jesus, don't just learn them, but put them into practice in our lives. If you're new to Anchor, uh, real quickly, I want to update you that the way that we are looking at the Sermon on the Mount, is, uh, is Jesus informing his followers the ways that he would expect them to live their lives. This is a manifesto of sorts, that Jesus is the leader. There are crowds of people gathering around Jesus. They're finding faith in Jesus. They're looking to him for hope. They're looking for a provision. They're looking for miracles. They're hoping that he is their Messiah, their Savior. And as they're looking to Jesus in anticipation that he would be their leader, he says, okay, if I am your leader and you are followers, let me lay out for you the expectation of, uh, of the conduct of my followers. So this is how we, why we can call it a manifesto. There is a leader. He gets to set the tone. He gets to set the rules. He gets to call the shots. And if we say, I'm going to be a follower of this leader, then we, we just lay down our opinions, our thoughts, our desires, and say, well, you're the leader, I do what you say. Uh, that's what it means to be a follower. Now, we can be uh, people of, that are spiritual people and not wanna follow the ways of Jesus, but uh, what we intend to be here at Anchor Church is not just spiritual people, people that have a faith inside of us, but ones that are gonna say, Jesus, you're the leader. You call the shots. And so I'm gonna learn to adapt and adjust my life and my conduct to your desires. I'm gonna actually follow you. I'm gonna put into practices your ways and your teachings. And so we're looking through uh, Matthew chapters five, six, and seven, hitting so many various topics uh, on what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Um, if you're willing and able, would you stand with me? College kids, you're getting your calisthenics today, uh, keeping you alert and alive. Uh, we're gonna just read through this text. Um, we're only gonna study a portion of the verses we're gonna read right now, but we're gonna read this whole section to bring in some context uh, for today. We're gonna read, Matthew uh, chapter 6, starting in verse 19 through the end of the chapter. I'll just read it out loud. You can follow along with your eyes on the screen or your Bible in front of you. Jesus says this. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your whole body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you will either hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Starting in verse 25 is where we're gonna zero in on here today. Jesus says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We believe that it is alive and it is active and it is transforming us more and more into your image. We pray once again that our hearts today would be open, receptive, and responsive to the ways that you are challenging us, Lord, that we would put into practice your words and your teachings. Lord, thank you that you know every worry. You know every anxiety. You know every stress. You know the condition of every emotion here today. 
and we trust you. Thank you that you're gonna speak and challenge and encourage your people today. We love you. In name we pray. And everybody said, amen. You can take a seat. Um, so this is a, a good portion of scripture that we just read through. Um, a lot of times we're just chewing on just little statements at a time. This is a, a larger portion of the text that we're gonna look at. And uh, reading through these verses, it's a bit difficult to like divide them and break them up. This is a pretty big section that kind of all flows together as Jesus is teaching. And uh, so today I'll just be upfront with you. I feel as far as a communication standpoint, uh, today's message is a bit incomplete. Uh, there's no way to encapsulate all the thoughts in here uh, in just one message, but uh, we're gonna dive into this. We're gonna continue on next week, um, but today will be a bit incomplete, probably gonna have a more abrupt ending than we usually have but excited to dig into this. As we look at this full text, uh, I had the privilege last week of visiting uh, Anchor Kids and Anchor Middle School, and I just love where we're taking these gospel concepts and just breaking them down in the most simple, understandable way. And the way that they were teaching a concept to four-year-olds, I was like, I needed that, like that made sense, thank you. So I was thinking about this today, this huge text that we're gonna do a, a bit of a deep dive in, but what are the essentials that maybe our four-year-olds could walk away with that I think we could apply to ourselves? So although today's a bit incomplete, over the course of the next couple of weeks, this is what I hope we can walk away with. God sees me, God loves me, I can trust him. If you're taking notes, let's write this down. God sees me, God loves me, and I can trust him. As we do a deep dive, if this is what we can walk away from the next couple of weeks with, it's a win. It's what Jesus is trying to communicate through these examples is there is a God, our Father, who sees you. What you're walking through is not distant to him, he sees you. And this God who sees you, he loves you. And not only does he love you, we can trust him. Oftentimes worry and anxiety that we're gonna dig into right here they're at odds with trust. The greater our trust, the greater our faith, the less worry begins to take place. So if we can walk away from this, that there's a God who sees you, who loves you, and we can trust him, it's what we're after. As we look at Jesus' words three times in this text, he makes the explicit statement to his followers, do not worry. Don't worry. So if we are taking this, this uh, Sermon on the Mount, and uh, just even surface level observation is Jesus is explaining what he wants his followers to look like, how he wants us to conduct their lives. It's an easy connecting point to say, Jesus does not want his followers to be worriers. He says it three times to his followers, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Now we can hear that and it's pretty explicit. And yet as followers of Jesus, we can be kind of scratching our heads. Like, have you looked around this world right now? Do you understand the responsibilities that I'm carrying in this life? How do I just not worry? But I think that we need to bow before the words of Jesus and say his desire as our leader is that his followers would be a people that don't worry. I think we need to agree on that right up front. If we're following Jesus, his desires, his followers would not be a people that worry. I understand the complication of thought that comes beyond that, but I think we have to start here. Oftentimes, we can't change our circumstances. We can't change what has happened that has led and developed worry or anxiety inside of us. But I do want to say that today, we do have the opportunity to decide how to respond to the worries of life. And maybe most importantly, we can decide the spiritual foundation of faith on which we stand when the circumstances that produce worry come our way. Even our name, Anchor Church, is derived from this verse in Hebrews chapter six that says we, in Jesus, we have a hope that is a strong and a trustworthy anchor for our souls. An anchor implies that there's gonna be wind, there's gonna be waves, there's gonna be storms, but we are gonna make it, not because of our ability to weather storms, but because we have an anchor that gives us hope through it all. I, uh, I think it might be wise of us um, and probably fair of us to give worries a couple of categories before we jump into this. Uh, by definition, note takers, you can write this down. I've got it on the screen. By definition, worry is distress or uneasiness of mind caused by fear of danger or misfortune. Distress, concern, uneasiness of the mind that is caused because of this, this fear of danger, misfortune. You're, you're thinking of all the negative possible outcomes that could be coming your way in the future. Now this is similar to stress, but it's not identical to stress. 
Uh, stress would be uh, the feeling of the weight of responsibility on you. When it turns into worry is when you start thinking things like, I'm never gonna be able to get this done. I, I'm not gonna be able to do it good enough or things are gonna go wrong, it's gonna go bad, they're not gonna show up. Are they gonna fulfill their end of the bargain? As soon as the negative concept begins to creep in, stress is now transitioning to worry. I was having this argument with myself. I, I'm easy to stress, but I didn't want to admit worry. But it's so easy to be like, no, actually, the weight it so quickly turns into what is defined as worry. Uh, so I would say that once we begin to worry, the new weight that we carry is anxiety. It is now, there is these thoughts in our mind of the negative potential outcomes that are lying ahead of us, and then that becomes a weight that we carry. And this is what we would identify as anxiety. So uh, stress, uh, stress is not always equal to worry and anxiety, but worry and anxiety, and even in this, the context of the scripture, they are a synonymous term. They always grow together. Uh, because there is weight, and then the negative potential outcome makes it worry, and then the weight that comes from that is now anxiety. So we're gonna talk about worry, we're gonna talk about anxiety. Worry can show up in so many different ways. Uh, it can be simple ways, or it could be complex ways, it could be some things that feel less meaningful, some that are more meaningful. It could be as simple as, uh, I'm, I'm worried that I'm not gonna wake up on time, so I'm not setting one alarm or two alarms, I'm setting the triple alarm in the morning. Although my alarm has always gone off, I'm worried that tomorrow will be the one time that it doesn't, so I'm multiplying my alarms. There's giggles, because you've been there. Uh, there's just like, it, it, the, the worst could happen. I don't know how many years it took me to believe that Apple understood daylight savings. Like, I'm always like, is it gonna go an hour earlier or not? Like, I, I, you had to set the alarm and make sure that they knew. Uh, we, we can worry about simple things. Um, we can worry about more important things. We can worry about, is the way that we're parenting messing up our kids? Invite you into my world for a second. You can worry about what is this doing to our kids? We can look at the world and have a lot of worries and frustrations. You can worry about the doctor's appointments that are coming up. There can be really meaningful moments of life too. Not only defining worry, but I wanna take a second. I was, today again is gonna be a bit of an intro. We'll get to scripture here in a moment, but um, intro to the next couple of weeks on worry and anxiety. I was trying to think through the different people present in the room, different circumstances, different personalities, and how do we speak to uh, everyone who's going through different circumstances. And so I want to uh, take a second to uh, talk about three different types of people, and there's probably more, and we probably overlap, but three types of people even present in the room today. Person one and person two, we're gonna talk more personality-wise. Person one, um, this would be, these are broad strokes, and uh, probably the most extreme version of this is someone who is just so carefree. Worry is not something that even crosses their mind. Like, life is good, why are we all worked up? Uh, someone like this would look around and be like, you people are taking life way too serious chill out, it's gonna be fine, we're gonna work this out, like it always works. There are people that are just really naturally more carefree. Uh, you guys are awesome, I need to hang out with you a little bit more. Uh, carefree, like why get worried about this? Like we're fine, we've made it this far, we're gonna make it another day, like why are we freaking out about this? Everyone else is taking life way too serious. If that's you today, this is like a comforting message. Like, yeah, don't worry, yeah, everybody else, listen to Jesus, it's what I've been trying to tell you, you're taking it too serious. There's a, a second type of person. Again, broad stroke, maybe far to the other side, but you are, uh, we'll just call you hyper-responsible. There's work to get done. Uh, we can't just sit and relax and ch what do you mean chill? Your perspective is probably looking at everyone else like they need to take life a little more seriously. Like this is a big deal. There's stuff to get done. There's people, that, uh, there's, why are you not a little bit more motivated in your life? Your perspective is probably people aren't doing their best. They're lazy uh, and they need to get motivated a little bit. A message like this is challenging for those most extreme because it's like, well, if Jesus said not to worry, I try to do everything by the book. I'm falling, trying to get it all done. I wasn't worrying about worrying, but now is my stress actually worry? Now I'm worried about worrying and it becomes complicated. I know these are broad strokes and extremes, but uh, you might find yourself even shifting kind of between the two based on circumstances, but we, to a degree, see these types of people and are both represented in the room. Um, some of you are clearly one of those types and you are married to clearly the other type. Is that anybody in the room today? Yeah, but you got some good stories. Uh, 
I wanna talk about a third type of person, and this is less about personality, and this is more circumstantial. There are people in the room today where we could begin teaching a, a couple of weeks on how you're not supposed to worry, but you are facing some very real circumstances. And your response today might be, how about you go through what I'm going through and then try making statements like this. There are, person two is probably just as a general propensity for anxiousness. Person three, regardless of your, your personality, you've got some health issues that you're waiting to hear back on. You're watching someone that you love walk through a terminal illness. You've heard that uh, your business is cutting jobs. You got notified that your rent is going up, but your pay is not. There's some real reasons that you're walking through some challenging situations. Some of you, it's your marriage. We're already separated. I'm worried that we're never gonna get back together. Some of you, you see the decisions that your kids are making and it terrifies you the path that they're walking down. So maybe some in the room that it's not your personality. It's like, well, I'm actually going through something it doesn't feel very good to just slap on three statements of, well, don't worry, you're following Jesus, don't worry. What do we do about this? When the concept of worry and anxiety and stress is prevalent in what we're going through, how do we respond? How do we say, this is real for me, and yet Jesus also said, I don't want my followers to be a people of worry. How do these come together? We're gonna do, uh, I'm gonna ask you guys to help me out here really quick. Um, I want you to score yourselves right now from one to 10. We have debates with our staff. Should you score things one to 10 or one to five? Uh, that's for another day. I don't know what your opinion is, but we're going with 10 today. Um, right now, before I ask you to do something for me, I want you to score yourself one to 10. One being, I never worry about anything. 10 being, I suffer from consistent anxiety. Uh, I want you to score yourself between one and 10. And then I'm gonna ask you to do something with that. One being, uh, I never really worry about anything. 10 being, I suffer from consistent anxiety. Now in a moment, uh, I'm gonna ask you to text in. We're gonna do this poll. We have this program um, that's gonna allow us to gather some data here. For one, it's maybe a little bit helpful for today, but it's also gonna be helpful uh, in the next couple of weeks. To not just be concepts of there's these types of people in the room, but who's actually in the room? Um, so here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna give you a little bit of direction before you text. Please don't text until I tell you to uh, because there's a certain way to do it for it to work right. Um, you're scoring yourself one to 10, but you're not going to text in that number. I know this is a little bit confusing, but I believe in you. Um, what we're gonna do, now you're worried about doing this right. Yeah, sorry. What you're going to do is in a moment, you're gonna text a specific word that's gonna jump you into the actual poll. If you don't text that word first, you're just texting into nowhere. Uh, but you're gonna text the word in just a moment. And then when you text that word, you'll get an auto reply, and then you're gonna put in a specific number for, for where you're at. Um, but before I tell you that so that you're not texting while I'm, I'm talking, uh, how, this is how it's gonna go. If you scored yourself a one through three, your second text in is going to be the number one. It's gonna put you in a group. One through three is all a one. If you are four through six, you're gonna text the number two. That's the second group. And then if you scored yourself a seven through 10, you're gonna text in the number three. So if you score yourself a three and you text in three, you're a low anxiety person that just scored as a high anxiety person. Does that make sense? You're not texting your score. You're texting uh, that number. So here's what I need you to do. And if you text in, yes, you are giving us your cell phone number. You might get an occasional church text. If you don't want that, don't text in or tell us stop the next time we text you. Uh, the goal is not to gather your data right here, but it gets your number. Uh, so here's what I need you to do. Would you text the word worry, W-O-R-R-Y, to 94,000? If you just text the word worry, if you want to participate, um, and you'll get an auto reply immediately, and then your next reply is only a single digit. You're either texting just the number one, just the number two, or just the number three. And it should say in that text, if you're texting the number three, your score is seven through 10. If, you are, uh, if your score is four, five, or six, you're texting the number two. If your score is one through three, you're texting just the number one. And then once you do that, you will get an, another auto reply if you are interested in the results within the room. Here we go. Wow.
We'll let it go for just another second here. Hundred and sixty seven responses, hundred and seventy, here we go. Wow. If you have your phone up and you're looking at the results, you can see it there. If you don't have it, I'll just say it real quick. Those uh, out of 176 responses, um, we've got 32 responses or 18%, score to one through three. We've got 76 responses or 42%, uh, score to four through six. And 69 responses, 38%, scored uh, a seven through 10. Um, so I just wanna take a moment to look at this. This is, who, this is, this is our community right now. Uh, and if you are the 17% that's low worry, man, do we have a lot to pray for and to care for for the rest of our community. To see that we've got um, a large portion of our church that is even seven to 10, 40% of the people in the room right now are facing whatever we wanna label high levels of worry, high levels of anxiety. And again, some of that might be personality, some of that might be anxiety. To see, uh, what is that, 82% of our church above a four. Uh, again, uh, there's a lot of details that could go into this, but um, we're sitting in a room where this is real. I think it's easy even to come into rooms like this and we're happy and we're smiling, it's good to see each other, and this is a great space to get to know somebody. But what we don't know is the odds are the person that you're sitting next to is stressed out, is anxious, is worried, and then this goes into a whole factor of other elements of life. You're probably not getting enough sleep, probably frustrated. There's probably relationships that aren't going well, whether it's to, if that's why they're worried or stressed or their worry and stress is impacting relationships. Uh, there's a lot of care to be had for one another. Those of you, again, I don't know your score specifically, but now what do we do about this? Jesus says, I don't want my followers to worry. We're a community of followers of Jesus, and there's a lot of this in our midst. I'm right there with you. What do I do about this? As we jump into this, um, the data on worry is unreal as I was studying this week. Worry and anxiety and depression, and um, it's out of control. When you start looking at how many people are being uh, prescribed antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds. Uh, if you look at the data, it starting in 2010 just is on a surge and it's not slowing down. You look at those that uh, are being put into mental health institutes for self-harming behavior and suicide attempts, it is skyrocketing. You start looking, I'm, I'm going through a book right now uh, called The Anxious Generation. I don't know if you've heard of it. I wish I had been able to finish it before today. I'm in the midst of it. I'm gonna keep going through it. Um, bringing a lot of data to the surface. And it's written by a guy who in one chapter is self-proclaimed atheist. It's not a Christian book, but he's got a chapter on spirituality and how having community of faith helps with worry and helps with anxiety. Um, but the, the data that he is bringing and, and what has happened in our world since 2010 and most of it revolving around overprotective parenting and, and the, the rise of the cell phone of screens and of social media, what it has done to the younger generation, um, it's tragic. We've got a big problem. Worry is, is, is prevalent, anxiety is through the roof and all of the ways that this begins to impact our lives. Anxiety is just the beginning of it when it starts to impact the way that you can hold a job, the way that you can hold a conversation, the way that you can pursue a romantic relationship. It has so many ripple effects when we are an anxious people. So when Jesus is telling us not to worry, he's not trying to get us to have like this boring life like th that we just don't care about. And he's like, no, I know what happens when you become a people that are filled with worry and fear of, of one another and fear of the future. I think that uh, as we talk about worry and anxiety, there are absolutely mental health conversations to be included. And I'm not an expert in this, I'm just trying to do some research and studying, but I believe that what I'm, I'm looking into is that there are large portions of our anxiety and our worries present in our lives today that are unintentionally self-induced and culturally induced. I say that because 
I think it's unfair of us to preach a message or to try to apply a teaching of Jesus that says not to worry without considering, well, what is causing this worry in the first place? I think that um, rather than just recognizing that 82% of us are worrying right now and just telling each other to stop it, that's not very helpful. Uh, I think we gotta take a moment to like, let's step back a minute and look at what we may be introducing into our lives that is producing the worry. And what if we did some attacking there? I think that uh, we're gonna look at today, we're gonna look spiritually what Jesus says. I think there are some spiritual applications to this as well as some natural, and I think that they overlap. Because I think if we're following Jesus and we're commanded something from Jesus, we need to look at what natural steps we can take to to follow him that way. If we were talking about prayer, of course we're gonna get, so what are some practical things we could do to incorporate prayer into our lives? I think if we were to tell somebody to stop lusting, as we've talked about already in, in the Sermon on the Mount, we're not gonna say, well, just stop lusting. We're gonna say, you need to stop putting yourselves in position where lust is right in front of you. Of course we're gonna go down that route. I think we have to do the same with worry. If worry is right in front of us, I think the obvious step is like, okay, let's scale it back a minute. And what are we doing that continues to produce this anxiety inside of us? And what do we do about it? How we gotta stop covering it up. If you got rotting garbage in your house, spraying for breeze might help the stench for a minute, but it's not doing the job. We have a, a toilet in our house right now that's not flushing, right? Um, it flushes, but it doesn't refill right. And, uh, and uh, we, it's been like a, a week straight now, I think. We've been busy, it's track season, you know. Uh, it, it's not flushing right. But we found this little loophole that um, it flushes fine, but then if you go, it, it doesn't refill. So if you reach down behind the toilet and turn the water off and then turn it back on, it fills right back up. Now, I know this. Uh, I just need to do a little bit of research and run and go grab a part and, and replace it and it'll be fine. But we found a way to make it work, you know. It's still, it's still functioning, kind of. Uh, now, here's the problem. If I don't do the work to go actually figure it out and, and replace the part that isn't functioning properly, this could become our new normal as it has. Our little nine-year-old goes to the bathroom and then is reaching under there and fixing it. Uh, this could be our normal. I mean, it's functioning. We're getting by. Why don't we just continue doing this? I think this is a danger. As, as we learn to cope with anxiety or we learn to cope with the stress of life or the cultural pressures or, or, or the worries that are developed, we may find coping mechanisms. And this just continues to be our normal, let alone cultural's new normal and what our children are being raised up in. Or we can do the work to figure out what is causing this in the first place. Again, this is gonna take a couple weeks to get into. We just have a little bit of time left today. I wanna look at this text that Jesus speaks to as Jesus gives us a spiritual response. How do we not worry? He starts in verse 25 by saying, that is why I tell you not to worry about your everyday life. We gotta look at that is why. I think it does a disservice to scripture. I think it does a disservice to Jesus. I think it does a disservice to you to, to view this teaching on worry and, and anxiety and isolation. I think it'd be easy just to start off a message in verse 25 and be like, hey, we're not supposed to worry. He's taking care of the birds. He's taking care of the flowers. He'll take care of you. But Jesus prefaces this three statements of not worrying by what he just talked about. He says, this is why you don't have to be a person of worry. So I think we need to look at what is why. And we did a deeper dive in this a couple weeks ago. But what has just been talked about is not storing up earthly treasures, but we're storing up that which is eternal. And, and we have this concept of not serving money. Instead, we're serving God. And, and he, he brings this together by saying, when you get these first few verses right, that's why I tell you, you don't have to be a person of worry. So what he's just laid out for us, and again, we spent a lot of time teaching on this, we'll make it really simple, is that we are a people who have our hearts set on eternity that we are storing up, we're living for, we're looking forward to. Our hope is not in this world. We are a people who have hearts and minds set on eternity. And the more eternally minded we become, that is how we can be a people that don't worry. If this life and its circumstances and things working out the way that we want them to, if that is where our hope is, good luck with worry. It, we're not gonna have it. But if we are a people who say, this life was never where I was supposed to find my security. 
My soul was never intended to find its home here. That every time there is a longing and there is a loss and there is an anxiety stirring up in me, it is a reminder that I am longing for a heavenly home. I'm longing for my soul being where God intended it to be in his presence in perfection for all eternity. And it stirs up a desire for the glorified bodies that we will have for eternity. He says, this is why the more eternally minded we become, the less we can see worry have an impact in our lives. I think it's significant to see Jesus making this connection. It's as though he would say, in light of the fact that God is your treasure and that your heart is set on eternity, let's talk about worry from that perspective. And then verses 26 through 30 illustrate the point made there in verse 25. And we're gonna go through these really quick today. And uh, we're gonna have a much more teaching next week. Verse 26 says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable than they are? Jesus simply stating, if God is sustaining the lesser creation, will he not sustain you? His human creation that bears his own image. Jesus didn't die on a cross for the birds. You're more important. He's taking care of them. He's gonna take care of you. I, uh, we look around and uh, birds are being provided for just fine. Uh, they're not dying off of extinction. I know there might be pockets of whatever going on around the world, but you just look at the evidence of the deposits made on my windshield this morning. Birds are finding food. Like, it's okay. They're not starving. Um, they're, they're finding food. And they're not cultivating their own resources. They are, God is providing through creation and, and they're, they're able to sustain now, this isn't without any effort at all. They're not just, they don't just come hatch out of their eggs and just wait for God to put food in their mouths. There is a, 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 a joining what God is providing and going and gathering and collecting. And there's birds that are, are uh, finding the worms. There's birds that are eating the berries. There's birds going and finding fish. There, there's birds flying south for the winter because they're not gonna sustain here. So they're making wise decisions and moving other places. Like there is provision from God. And then there is a, a taking taking hold of that which God has provided. And he's like, Jesus is saying like, everything to feed yourself, to close it, like God is providing it. We don't cause the sun to shine. We don't cause the rain to fall. We go and we work and we gather and we collect. He's given us everything that we need, just like the birds. Now there may be some participation in saying, God, you provided this and I'm gonna go grab it. Uh, but he is providing everything that we need as he has for the birds. So stop worrying. He's got this figured out. Verse 27, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? We all know the answer to this rhetorical question. Of course it doesn't. Worry is always robbing. It's always taking. It's always distracting. Anxiety is unproductive. It is stealing from us. I've never heard of a health coach, a counselor, a therapist advocate for getting up in the morning. And before you even get your cup of coffee, would you just take the first 30 minutes stressing about everything that's gonna happen today? Think about the worst possible outcome. Just like visualize it, embrace it, see it, and your life is gonna be so much better for it. Obviously, we all know it's not healthy, it's not productive, it's not helping us, it is taking away from our lives. Uh, how many times do we worry about something that never happens? I don't know how someone collects this data, but as I was reading it this week, like 90% of what we worry about never happens. I don't know how they figure that out, but that's what they say. 90% never happens. But then person two is in here saying, well, the 10% is, and if it's not worried about, it's not gonna get figured out. Says, but it doesn't help us to be people of worry and anxiety. Verse 28, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work or make their own clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today, thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? God sees you, God loves you, you can trust him. The word look at the lilies, some translations say consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Um, and maybe for the first time ever this week, I like tried to do that. Like, how do they grow? <laughs> They're beautiful, I love seeing the flowers as you're hiking in the, the mountains around here. Um, but these flowers that grow and grow so beautifully, you know what they do? There's probably a lot more scientific explanation than this one, but this is as far as my brain goes, considering they grow roots wherever they happen to be planted and they grow towards the sun. It's like, this is where I am. 
I didn't choose to be planted here. I didn't choose that the seed would fall here. This is where I am. And they grow. And that, they can't even like go find water like the birds can. They are just there, fully dependent on the provision of God to sustain them. Jesus is like, look at the birds. Look at the flowers. Every spring, I love that this is happening in spring. We can look out. I got a climb sentinel earlier this week and they're just, they're just starting to come out. And like, he's doing this. He's sustaining them. If the flowers are continuing and the birds are continuing, we can trust him. We're gonna end this pretty abruptly and a bit differently. And I, I know as a communicator, I feel this is incomplete, but I'm gonna ask the band to join me right now. Um, simple prayer that I have this week, and I think God's gonna answer it. Uh, I'm praying that this week, you hear birds chirping more than you usually do. I hope they wake you up like just five minutes early, not, not, not an hour or anything like that. I hope you go for a walk and you see some flowers blooming. I hope you drive through town and see those trees. Are they apple trees right now that the white flowers are coming out? I hope you see more flowers blooming and more birds chirping than you can remember in your whole life. And every time you hear that bird chirp, and you see that flower blooming, the gospel is being preached to you. It's like, look, they're sustaining. They made it through that winter. They came through. And are you not more valuable than they are? When I walk out and I see that bird poop on my windshield, I'm gonna say, Jesus, preach the gospel to me right now. You're providing for them. You got me. You see me. You love me. I can trust you. I mean, some of you guys are gonna go on a hike this week. I don't know how low the flowers are blooming right now. But you're gonna go for a walk and the Holy Spirit is gonna preach the gospel to you through the simplicity of a flower. And you're gonna hear a bird chirping and the gospel is gonna be preached to you. Like it's gonna say, I know you're worried. I know you got these circumstances right now. I know you're stressed out about the family and the kids and the money and the job. I know that, but look around right now. God's got you. He sees you. He loves you. You can trust him. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm actually gonna ask the prayer team. Um, anyone available, would you just split sides here, that side of that speaker and that side of that speaker because it's loud in front of them. Um, we have communion set up at the front. And our response today is, uh, I'm gonna ask anyone who would desire to take communion with us. I know it's gonna make it a little congested up here, but I want you to physically respond by walking up, grabbing those communion elements on tables on both sides of the, the platform up here. And you can take it back with you. And I know we didn't really dig into specific worries hardly at all today. We don't have to wait till next week or the week after. I believe that God is gonna move in your life today, that the gospel is gonna be preached to you today. I believe that uh, anxiety is gonna be broken today. I believe that worries are gonna be relieved today. I believe that we're gonna take this moment, as we're taking community, what we're doing is we're setting our hearts back on eternity. We're recognizing that Jesus, your body was broken, your blood was poured out so I could have everything provided for me, not just in this life, but for eternity. The provision that you gave me is eternal life. And I'm reminding myself through communion today that you provided everything that I need. That your goal wasn't just my comfort here, it was that I would spend eternity in your presence. Your body was broken. Your blood was poured out to be the ultimate provision for my life. You died for me because you saw me. You saw how lost I was, how unable to rescue myself I was, and you loved me so much that you sent your one and only son, that anyone who believes in you doesn't have to perish but experience eternal life. As you take communion, uh, I believe that there's some of you, as you go back to your seats, you need to stop with this prayer team, and they're just gonna pray for you. You don't have to tell them a whole lot. You can tell them whatever you want, but just say, hey, I'm worried, I got anxiety, or hey, here's the circumstance going on in my life, and we're just gonna pray prayers of faith with you, believing that God is gonna move on your behalf. When you take communion, when you get back to your seat, I just want you to pray. I want you to say, God, I know that you see me. I believe that you love me. The bread and the cup is evidence. And I'm putting my trust back in you today. Would you stand? Jesus, we love you. As we come and we take communion, 
we're reminding ourselves, we're setting our hearts back on eternity. You see, you love, we can trust you, you provide. God, you know what the 82% of worry and anxiety actually looks like today. You see it and we trust you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. We'll dismiss in a moment. Would you just start making your way? Grab communion. You can feel free to stop for prayer. I know it's going to be congested, uh, but we're, we're going to sing one last song, pray, and we'll get out of here.